Hey, it's Rick Kettner here. Let's explore three powerful insights from the startup J Curve by Howard Love. Now, it's no secret that many startups ultimately fail. But what is less understood is how most successful startups are actually forced to make dramatic changes to their original idea in order to make it work. And as a result of this, many entrepreneurs today have the mistaken belief that their initial idea will either work or it won't, and that there is no in-between. And this belief can ultimately cause them to fail. Now, fortunately, the startup journey tends to unfold in a very predictable pattern. And the more that you understand and appreciate this pattern, the greater your odds are for success. The Startup J-Curve breaks this process down into six predictable phases, and it provides detailed advice on how to move through each one of these steps in the journey. So rather than feeling overwhelmed or confused when you reach an inevitable setback, you can put these various challenges into context and move your business idea forward with much greater confidence. So with that in mind, let's explore three of my favorite insights from the book, beginning with insight number one. Be prepared for the dip in the J-curve. Startups are very, very difficult. There's no question about that. That's the reason why so many ultimately fail. But one of the bigger challenges is how to allocate your resources very early in the startup journey. In almost every case, there's a lot more opportunity and a lot more options that you wanna pursue than you actually can pursue given the limited time, energy, and resources that you have in the startup phase. Now, the Startup J Curve provides a guide through the six different phases, and this map can make it much easier for you to identify the best way to allocate your time and energy in order to move your idea forward. But we're gonna come back to that here in a minute in terms of the six stages. What I really wanna focus on here is just the shape of the J-curve, because a lot of entrepreneurs seem to believe that the trajectory of their startup is gonna simply be a nice, smooth, upward progression, and that they're gonna build their product, they're gonna launch it to the marketplace, they'll gain some sales, and it'll be steady growth from there. And unfortunately, this isn't the reality for the overwhelming majority of startups. And so when we look at the J-curve, it's actually shaped like a lowercase j, or you might also compare it to something like the Nike swoosh. There's an immediate dip before eventually it starts to move back in an upward trajectory. Now, the reason for this is interesting because at the very beginning of a new startup, you're actually at a bit of an artificial high because at this very beginning stage, you're still optimistic about your idea, you're excited to get started, you're putting together your team, you're refining the idea itself, in some cases, you're raising money for your startup, and so everything's moving in a very positive direction, and in many ways, you're a little bit disconnected from reality because you have this amazing idea, but you haven't actually put it into work yet. And so as you begin to truly work on the new business and start to build the product and start to move your idea forward, that's where reality starts to settle in. And you start to come across unforeseen challenges that actually shape how you think of your business. And so emotionally, psychologically, and even financially, your business takes a little bit of a dip because you're facing these unforeseen challenges. For example, products take longer to develop than expected. Customers don't embrace the initial offering. The business model doesn't quite work yet, and in some cases, money can start to dry up. And so this is the reason why when we look at the J-curve, there's this immediate dip. And this is sometimes referred to as the valley of death or death valley, because this is where many startups ultimately fail. And so it's very important to understand that this is a natural part of the startup journey, that you should fully expect this dip to occur, where again, a 
emotionally, psychologically, and even in some cases financially, you're actually going to be worse off than when you first started. And so it's important to prepare for this and to recognize that just because you enter these more difficult stages doesn't mean your business is necessarily going to fail, but rather there are things that you have to specifically focus on in order to make it through those stages so that eventually your business can be more successful. So with that in mind, let's continue on to insight number two. Understand the six phases of a startup. Now, I cover each of the phases in more detail in my full written summary on rickketner.com, and I'll link that up for you down in the episode description box. But here, I just wanna give you a quick overview of all six phases, including create, release, morph, model, scale, and harvest. Each one requires a primary focus and presents unique challenges. And of course, the book provides a lot of helpful advice that can allow you to make the most of each phase and help you move your business idea forward. So let's go through each of the six phases, the first of which is create. This is where you really focus on refining your idea, building your team, and starting to raise money. And this is actually one of the very best times for you to raise money for your startup because as we talked about earlier, this is a time where everybody's very optimistic and very excited about the opportunity and you've yet to really face the reality of common challenges or other issues that might come up when you go to actually execute your idea. So here at the create phase, it's one of the very best times for you to bring on potential investors and to raise money for your startup. Now internally in your business, you wanna focus on treating your idea as a hypothesis. You wanna Strike the balance between, on the one hand, being very committed to bringing your idea to life and building it as a startup, but on the other hand, remaining flexible when it comes to potentially needing to change or evolve your idea over time. The next phase is release. Here the focus is on building a minimum viable product and getting it out into the market as quickly as possible. And one of my favorite pieces of advice from the book is understanding that this stage is not the make or break stage that many entrepreneurs believe it to be. I know as an entrepreneur and talking with other entrepreneurs, many people believe that when they first ship their product, if it doesn't immediately find success, then their business or their idea might simply fail. And so it's very tempting to fall into the trap of procrastination and perfectionism and feature creep, trying to make the very first iteration of your product as great as possible. But the reality is, with this stage, what you really wanna focus on is simply getting your first iteration out into the marketplace so that you can begin to gather helpful feedback. That is the goal here, getting feedback that you can use to shape the future of your idea. So the next phase is morph. Here it's important to embrace radical change. You wanna be prepared for the possibility that your idea will not be received as expected and that you will need to make drastic changes to your idea in order for it to be successful. And this is kind of the bottom of the dip where you're really reassessing exactly what it is that you're doing and again, making big changes. Now. In the rare event that your product does immediately gain traction in the marketplace, then what you're gonna focus on here is just making incremental improvements to your idea to fine tune it and to make sure it has the best chance for success in the market. But in all likelihood, what you're really gonna to need to do here is completely rethink your idea based on the feedback that you received in the previous stage. And another really powerful bit of advice from the book is that this is where the real epiphany happens. So while many entrepreneurs seem to believe that the original idea is the breakthrough, this is the moment in time where you have the most amount of information. You've gathered valuable feedback and now you're in a position to come up with a much better idea to move your business 
forward. Now, it's important to note that some businesses will need to go through multiple morphs in order to achieve customer traction. So as you gather information, you put out another iteration of your product based on what you have learned, and you repeat this process until you achieve customer traction. And again, because this is the morph phase, you're often coming up with a very different strategy with each morph based on what you've learned. The next stage is model. This is where you revisit the business model of your idea because a lot has changed over the previous phases, especially the morph phase. So now you wanna stand back, look at your idea from a brand new perspective and think about the best way for you to monetize that idea, reconsidering the business model entirely because there's a very big difference between building something that people want and finding an effective way to monetize that so that your business can benefit from launching that product or service out into the marketplace. So you may end up needing to test multiple monetization strategies from one-time pay to subscription to perhaps a freemium model, or you may end up needing to revisit who your target audience is. In some cases, your product or service might do okay with a certain audience, but will do much better if you turn around and sell it to another audience. The end goal here, behind the model phase is to ultimately find a business model where if you invest additional cash into the business, you can reliably and predictably generate even more cash out of the business on the back end. So you're creating this revenue generating machine. The next phase is scale. This is where you assemble the people, the processes, and the additional money needed for rapid growth because you've already got a great product or service, you've already got a great business model, now is the time to really accelerate growth to take full advantage of your opportunity and to ward off potential competitors that might see the success that you're beginning to have. So it's very important to scale as quickly as is possible. Now, this might seem pretty straightforward, but one of the larger challenges among several others is managing the shifting needs when it comes to your team. Because early in a startup, many people in the team are bound to be generalists, people that can take on various roles and can help out wherever needed. But as you shift into the scale phase, it's very important to shift from generalists to specialists. So as the leader in your organization, you're gonna to have to help people identify their specialized roles, the areas where they're most effective. And in some cases, people might end up leaving the organization at this point because they don't have a clear specialized role. And another thing you're really gonna to need to focus on is expanding the team. You're gonna to need to hire a lot of specialized people so that you can more effectively scale up the organization. And one thing you're gonna to wanna to focus on here is over hiring. Hiring people that have more experience or more expertise than is currently needed in your business because as it grows, you're gonna need that experience and expertise in place in order to be much more effective. Now, the sixth and final phase is harvest. As the name suggests, this is an opportunity for you to reap what you have sown over the previous five phases. And there are many important considerations for you to make during this phase, including future growth possibilities, compensating shareholders, and potentially selling the business. Many new options exist at this point, and of course, the book has a lot of great advice on how to make the most of this phase. Now, some entrepreneurs are gonna end up trying to shortcut the process, or without even understanding the J-curve and its implications, they might simply end up getting ahead of themselves. So with that in mind, let's continue on to insight number three. Avoid the two most common mistakes. Each of the phases must be completed in the order in which we covered them. And this is very important because you can't effectively move to the next stage until you've completed the previous stage. And if you do jump ahead of yourself, eventually you're simply gonna have to come back and in all likelihood, you will have wasted a lot of time, energy, and resources trying to skip ahead and ultimately failing. So with that in mind, let's cover 
two of the most common mistakes that entrepreneurs make when progressing through the startup J-curve. Mistake number one, focusing on the business model before figuring out the product. Early in the startup journey, people are inevitably gonna ask you about how you plan to monetize your idea. But while it is important to keep this in mind and to think about how you might monetize your idea, you don't wanna focus on this too early because as I mentioned earlier, there is a big difference between creating something that people want and finding the most effective way to monetize it. And if you're overly focused on monetization, you can limit your creativity when it comes to building a great product. And as a general rule, if you're able to create a great product, there will almost certainly be a way to effectively monetize it. So first focus on creating a great product and worry about coming up with the perfect business model later. Mistake number two is scaling things up before nailing the product or business model. It's common for entrepreneurs that are stuck in either the release phase or the morph phase to believe that growth is the answer. So for example, they might put together a minimum viable product, launch it out into the marketplace, and it doesn't receive the traction that they were hoping for. And so suddenly they think maybe if they increase their advertising spend and get that product in front of many more customers, that will ultimately solve their problem. But really, they're getting ahead of themselves. They're trying to scale up the business before they've really validated the product. And simply spending more is not going to solve the problem. In fact, it's going to create a new problem in that they're going to start burning their cash that is very much needed when it comes to going back through an additional morph to figure out how to get the product or service to resonate with customers. So it's very important that you don't scale up before you've nailed the product. And of course, all of this can be avoided by simply going through each of the six phases in the correct order. And that is the real power of getting familiar with the startup J-curve by Howard Love. Anyway, those are three of my favorite insights from the book. Let's quickly recap all three. Number one, be prepared for the dip in the J-curve. Number two, understand the six phases of a startup. And number three, avoid the two most common mistakes. Now, of course, there is so much more covered in the book that we simply cannot get to in this short format, including how to raise money for your startup, dealing with the personal side, of startup life and applying the J curve within large organizations. So if you're building a startup and you wanna have a better understanding of how to move your business idea forward and a way to improve your odds for success, then I highly recommend that you consider picking up a copy of the Startup J Curve by Howard Love. That's it for this episode. If you have any questions or comments about anything that we covered here, let me know down in the comment section below. And be sure to subscribe and visit rickkettner.com if you're interested in other great insights from the best business books for entrepreneurs. Thank you for tuning in, and I look forward to connecting with you again in the future.